So here we have a full right leg prosthesis hinged at the knee with a common lever here to lock or unlock the articulation of the joint here. Um, the foot um, has a, a boot, laces, a sock, all to give some form of normality about the limb, like it's good cosmetic appearance. Interesting about this limb as well is the customization which has gone on by the patient with scarves, various pieces of cloth wrapped around over time with loose stitching here to try and aid some form of comfort. The limb does look as if it has been quite well worn by the user. Um, so the limb would be secured to the body with this um, movable bracket on the side of steel leading up to leather strapping and a form of brace to come up to, to take the weight over the body. Here we have um, two full arm prosthesis. Uh, now these are actually both uh, given by the same patient, or relatively the same patient. And so we do know that um, the patient had his arm amputated when he was 19 years old. And these um, are the limbs which were found in an attic um, as the house had been cleared. Um, now, they look, to all intents and purposes, very similar, but, and they are, but the, there are minor differences between the two. Um, now, I do know from um, the patient's grandson that the limbs were hardly worn because they were so awkward and the chap would much rather just get on um, as he was. But, so, we can see here where um, this piece here would be fit, fitted via the shoulder. There was a short stump that would, would fit into to here, so it was probably um, above el elbow amputation that the, the chap had. And shoulder strapping would secure it onto the body. So this would go over the other arm, over the back, one piece across the chest, to take the weight of the limb there. Um, this particular one has um, some form of articulation via these lever clips here, which you can rotate the arm, but only to fixed positions. It will clip back into place uh, in that way. There's a, a lever here just, um, just before the uh, bend of the elbow here, and this, this controls the, I can manage to make it work. This controls the, oops, here we are here. This one controls the extension of the arm, again to two or three fixed positions. In this case of um, prosthetic uh, limbs and gadgets, um, if we take a, a chronological look, you can see uh, lower left foot here, which varies um, from the one we saw down in the store earlier on, uh, in both in its structure and also the way the um, stump would fit in here. So this is um, probably the earliest piece in the case. And again, if you can contrast that with the le full leg prosthetic, which is behind, great advances in technology from 1935 to 1986 and again further advances from there. Um, the hand 
again illustrates um, the full length prosthetic we saw in the store earlier on and again this would clip here this catch here onto the full arm or partial arm to it belongs to. Um, this one here from 1989 um, is obviously a child's arm from the elbow joint to the fingers. There's a, a battery compartment here and the electronics are quite obvious uh, which operate these mechanical fingers. Now there's three fingers which is enough to have a substantial grip and pick objects up and put them down. Um, there are pressure sensors inside the arm which would then be operated by uh, muscular movements of the remaining part of the arm. Um, cosmetically as well there would be a real, quite realistic um, latex or rubber hand which would come across to you and so it wouldn't be as obvious or as frightening, especially for a child, to have three um, claw-like fingers here. Uh, also with prosthetics, it's, I mean, we, we normally think of um, you know, full re limb replacement, but that's not always, always the case either. Prosthetics extend much further to these early attempts at cosmetic um, deployment as well. So someone here had lost, had a significant eye injury here. And so it was an attempt to make them uh, feel better, either give them more confidence or at least attract less attention. You know. and likewise here, this, this pair of glasses with the nose and May, may even seem quite comical as well, but you know, there's a very serious side to it. And the prosthetic ear uh, on this side. Uh, the remainder of the case here, again, prosthetics, <coughs> but all of an internal nature. So um, here are developments of a uh, hip joint. So this section would extend down into the top of the Femur, and this would fit a plate which would go into the, the hip itself. Um, it's taken a long time to develop the materials to make successful joints. Up here is a, an early one, and um, this one is actually made of ivory. So this is elephant ivory which is being carved. So this uh, the the makers be looking for something that was strong, substantial, but again very smooth so it didn't adhere or um, attract a lot of um, um, bacterial growth. These ones here are vascular grafts, so these would replace um, major vessels in the body which perhaps aneurysm injury had become damaged.
Our display of wheelchairs uh, tries to track the development of personal mobility. So the first wheelchair you can see is often called a bath chair. They're made of wood and wicker. Um, they would have been used for what people would call convalescing often, but were also used for people with mobility issues. Something that you can notice quite straight off the bat is that you wouldn't have been able to use this wheelchair on your own. Someone would have had to push you. You would have had no control over where you were going. Also, if you imagine someone pushing you over any kind of ground that wasn't entirely flat, the trip would have been very bumpy and uncomfortable for both the person in the chair and the person pushing the chair. So we try and track how wheelchairs have developed so that people are more mobile on their own. So the other wheelchairs in the display, for instance the Freedom One, is a particular development by an engineer who made a wheelchair for himself, for his needs, because he didn't find anything similar on the market. The Carbon Black wheelchair is made of particularly lightweight material, which in terms of the development of wheelchairs was revolutionary. Okay, so we're standing in front right now of a case full of prosthetic arms, the majority of which were made within miles of where we're currently standing here in Edinburgh. So at the top of the case is a set of arms designed by David Simpson. Uh, these were made for children affected by thalidomide. So actually, before that, there was not a unit here in Edinburgh to treat children who had uh, limb loss or residual limbs when they were born. After, in the wake of thalidomide, there was quite a lot of funding here in Edinburgh for prosthetics, and it became a leader in childhood prosthetics throughout Europe. So the first couple sets of arms that you can see are actually quite small. So they're right here. A lot of people think they're partial parts of an arm, but actually it's a full arm. So David Simpson began working with very small children to start off with, um, and as the children grew, their needs grew as well. So the tops of the arm, the top set of arms there that you can see, or maybe not see, but the top set of arms that you can see um, were gas powered, and only one of the arms would have worked. The other was entirely cosmetic. The children had three great needs, to be able to write, to be able to feed themselves by their own, on their own, and be able to go to the laboratory on their own. This was the Scottish government's ruling of what children would have to do by themselves in order to go to public school. David Simpson designed these arms for children affected by thalidomide. They were practical, but they were very heavy. So they were gas powered, and one reporter actually described them as children who used them as looking like they were going scuba diving with packs on their back. And when they ran out of gas, the arms would just drop to the side and be entirely useless. And so, as time progressed, um, the centre here in Edinburgh continued to grow, but to look into different avenues, and that created the MS arm, the Edinburgh Modular Arm System. It was the first prosthetic um, to have an individually powered shoulder, elbow, and wrist, which made it the world's first bionic arm, and it has that moniker in the Guinness Book of World Records. Um, the MS arm was created here and founded the first spin-out company um, from the NHS called Touch Bionics, which created um, the island. prosthetic hand uh, introduced uh, for the first time in 2007 uh, and it is a Scottish product designed and manufactured in, uh, in, in Scotland. It is often referred as bionic hands uh, in the mass media uh, usually and bionic because actually it just uh, mimics uh, the movement of a real hand. So for example if I activate here the products, if I open and close, if I use this ball here you can see that actually the movement of the end is exactly just respect the shape of the objects. So if I would take the objects in my hands and do the same, you can see that I'm really close with my, with my prosthetic hands. So all the fingers move independently, meaning that if I just have some resistance against the finger, they automatically close and stop according to the objects that they encounter. You have lots of precision with this type of device and you can go to some specific modes here. You can see that all the fingers are working together, so the five fingers, including the rotation of the thumb. And I can decide to go to a more specific mode using uh, a switch to, for example, point here to use 
uh, <coughs> a keyboard or uh, a mobile device and etc. The, the, the finger is touch screen. Or I can go to uh, here, for example, in a tripod pinch. So if I take an object like this, I can grip it here and just put it back. So the old conditions like this. So I can take all kind of objects. I can also take something that is much more fragile, like for example, a plastic cup here. So it's a not in, this one is not in plastic, but the uh, idea, and I can just have the objects, and the object is not crushed by the movement of the hand. So that means that the patient has a huge versatility in terms of use of the of, of his prosthetic. So what we're doing here is we are finding the muscles in the arm to activate the hand. We can get the patient here to close. And close the hand, and we can get the patient then to open their hand again. Okay, and to close, and to open. So what we're doing here is we use an app on our iPad, and we can see the muscle activity that the patient's using to activate the hand. Traditional myelectric hands very much were a single grip, which only gave patients one way to use their prosthesis. So the Ilam hand, the fact that it offers a motor on each finger, rotation of the thumb, is allowing the hand to work in a much more natural way. So therefore, for individuals using the type of prosthesis that we now have available, it's much more natural, it looks more natural, but also functions in a more natural way for them. Um, it can shape around objects, so you're not having to compensate quite so much in their day-to-day -day activities. They can shape to their favourite mug for a cup of tea, they can shape to what they need to dress their children, you know, any of these practical day-to-day -day activities that people do, the hand can just adapt in such a much more natural and intuitive way as to how their actual a natural hand would um, behave. The thumb rotation is great because it gives a real range of those grips, so you're not just looking at that one grip function, you can rotate it if you're using a key or any flat objects handing over money or uh, credit cards, business cards, any of those type of things that people do, this hand behaves much more like like that and interacts in a much more natural way with their, their day to day life. So um, that's where the real benefits are with what new technology is offering is we've actually got a hand that is much more of what people need from their day to day lives rather than people having to, to compensate um, because they have some form of limb absence, whether that be through amputation or, or, or born, just they were born that way. So it's really offering much more functionality and that's where the, the journey of the technology has really brought us to is something that is a more realistic and more able to be engaged in a lifestyle with less compensation.